being said, today I'm very excited to announce our first presenter, our first speaker, our first guest who is very special. Um, if you have heard of the game of Peglin, yeah, yeah, lots of fans. If you haven't heard of it, it is really, really impressive. Uh, and, and it's not just a testament to Dylan as a game developer, but also as a business mind of how, like, we all, all of us here, we probably just want to make our own games and, like, live off of that. And I think Dylan has thought about that a lot uh, through his experience before Peglin and into now, and he's really been able to have a lot of success thinking about it and bringing that into how he's made his game and how he's launched the game. And I'm really excited to have him teach us about that, all of that. So let's welcome Dylan Gay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's me. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. It's so awesome to be here. Um, we've been around the Vancouver scene for a while. Uh, Aaron, in the second row here, if you want to give a wave, is the only Red Nexus member that's actually in Vancouver. Uh, the rest of us are in uh, Victoria, and I actually live in uh, Penticton right now. Moved there during the pandemic, uh, which I'll touch on a little bit, just because you know we're fully remote and it's kind of interesting. But uh, I'm here to talk about how we kind of bootstrapped this game that um, you know was never really meant to be a commercial success. It kind of came out of nowhere and surprised us, uh, let alone I think everyone else that was kind of looking at it, being like, you know, this is not going to go anywhere. Um, we pitched to like 12 publishers about six to eight months into development and just got like the coldest responses ever. Um, and I'll get into that a little later too. Uh, pretty simple little talk today. Uh, I was really just going to focus on like the development part of this and like what we actually did to like bootstrap this game and make it happen. But we get asked a lot about some of the design decisions that we made and marketing I think is really the kind of you know, dark horse that kind of took this game as far as it went. Um, so I'd be kind of remiss if I skipped over that. Uh, but we'll kind of just get into a little bit of everything. It's kind of like not quite a post-mortem because we're still not out of early access, but like a mid-mortem. <laughs> um, so who am I? I? I'm the founder of Red Nexus Games. Uh, for a while, I was like the sole developer of Peglin. Um, so I kind of wear a little bit of every hat, lots of different hats. Uh, I've been making games for 12 years, which is kind of crazy, but here we are. Um, and the main point of this game in particular, like it started at a game jam before the pandemic, and that was just kind of for fun. The main point of it, like once, you know, it was kind of to make it an actual real thing, was to kind of keep myself sane during lockdown. It was like, I'm stuck inside, everyone else is stuck inside, what are we gonna do? I might as well like make a game that's going to take six months to finish, and uh, you know we'll see where we go after that. Um, for those of you who don't know what Peglin is, I do have a little GIF here. Uh, so if you've played Peggle before, it's going to look pretty uh, familiar. And then uh, it's very cool to have a speaker from Slay the Spire on after this because uh, yeah, we kind of stole a lot from Slay the Spire. <laughs> but that's it's okay. It's it's a it's a, a rising tide lifts all boats. It's a collaborative industry. <laughs> Um, here's some core details. So Steam Early Access, uh, pretty much, yeah, oh my goodness, what day is it today? It's like almost exactly two full years uh, since Early Access. We launched at $20. We heard an endless amount of complaints about that. It was, you know, it was maybe a little sparse on content for $20, but it was like right in that period of like hyperinflation. And if we had priced too low, Things could have crumbled on us. You know, it's really hard to say like what was the better decision. I don't know. Clearly, it worked out for us. Um, yeah, we launched with 75,000 wish lists on Steam. We had 62,000 before we appeared in the popular upcoming. So that's kind of like that last two weeks where you're kind of on the front page of Steam. Uh, but we mysteriously sold 100,000 copies within the first two weeks, which I've seen a lot of postmortems, and none of them have ever had that. Um, and we'll get into kind of why that might have been. And then, yeah, so two years in early access now and we've sold over 500,000 copies, which still blows me away. It's, this game came out of nowhere and completely upended our lives uh, in a good way. <laughs> Thank you. I promise there's one more slide that's like kind of very kind of braggy and it's in there for a good reason, I promise. I'm, I swear I'm a humble person. Uh, let's get right into the design. Uh, this is what the game looked like after the first 24 hours of development. 
Uh, it was called Goblin Drop. You can still play it on itch.io if you're so inclined. It's, uh, it's not great, but it's still already like kind of sticky. You know, like it feels kind of gross. There's no polish. There's no good feedback or anything. But you still like just want to try it a couple more times until you, you know, see if you can beat it. And you can see like a lot of the DNA of the game is already kind of there. Um, at this stage, I actually wanted it to be kind of like Puzzle Quest. It was kind of going to be like an eight-hour RPG that you just kind of play through once while gaining new skills and abilities. Um, and as I kind of tinkered with it, uh, it just it wasn't really. I couldn't find a way to like make the powers satisfying, and it was so hard to test. Like you know, what does an hour of gameplay look like? And I was playing a lot of Slay the Spire at the time, so <laughs> we changed it up. And uh, it kind of became a different thing where you're kind of adventuring through. Um, this really should have been a shot of the map, but that's OK. So this is kind of, I would say this is about four months into development. Um, so you can kind of see we've got like the concept of the reload in there. You've got you know, a few things have changed, but like not a whole lot. I think at this stage, there were actually different battles. So it was starting to like get some of the you know, data um, fleshed out, but you know, still pretty different from what the game looks like today. Um, we had no development budget. We, you know, it was a passion project. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the team looked like, uh, but it was just fully on the side of full-time jobs um, until mid-2021, so about a year and a half of development on the side of full-time jobs. And then we were in a Tiny Teams Festival, which is an amazing festival if your team is less than like six people. Definitely recommend applying. Uh, we were in a PAX 10, but it was like, you know, still during the pandemic, we were actually in like the PAX East 10, which was kind of cool because, you know, until that point, we'd really only been applying for like PAX West because it's easy drive to Seattle. Um, so the pandemic did have a few, I mean, it had a lot of benefits for us in this particular context. So it had a few silver linings for things like this. Um, and we got in like a demo out really early and kept it up and then continued to kind of iterate over it for a very long time. Um, and that's really where like a core of this kind of came from. Um, and I will say like it wasn't all like sunshine and roses right off the bat. Um, it took us, yeah, about two years two and a half years since the first game jam to reach that 8,000 wish list. Uh, for the first year and a bit, we still only had like 1,500, which like was a little demoralizing. You know, you kind of want to have about 8,000 to make sure that you're gonna kind of appear on the front page of Steam, but that wasn't the purpose of the game. The purpose of the game was for me. So I just kept plucking away at it and you know, it eventually paid off. Um, but I won't say that like, you know, from day one, there was an indication that this game was going to take us, take our world by storm. And no, it was not like that. Um, just to, like a big design point here is like genre combinations are super risky. Uh, when it works, it works really well. Like look at Crypto the Necrodancer. You know, that's like their entire pitch is like, what if a roguelike was also a rhythm game? Uh, but if you're not careful, you end up really isolating anybody that doesn't really love both things. If you can ideally like appeal to both sides of that Venn diagram, then you're in a good spot. And you have to like really focus on what about your game can reach out into both of those audiences. So one like core design tenet for Peglin is that like the game is fully turn-based. You know, we had a lot of people that like came in from physics puzzlers or came in from pinball that like really wanted the ability to nudge. They really wanted the ability to like manipulate the ball in mid-flight. Um, and for us, like, you know, it was more on the side of roguelike deck building. The core of the game is like the synergies that you're creating. And sure, it's about that aim, but once you have aimed and fired, there's like no more actions on your part. Um, and that was something that was really deliberate for me. Uh, I had a young puppy at the time that was a little bit of a nuisance. And I wanted to be able to just like put my game down at any time without having to like hit pause or anything. And a lot of the games that I was playing at the time operated in the same way. So that was really important for myself to like cover that base. And I'm really glad that I did. And there's another pachinko roguelike uh, called Round Guard. And theirs focuses a lot on like active abilities. So for us, it was a really nice like design space to just kind of stay away from. And any players that like were coming in and repeatedly asking for that, it's like, well, have you tried Round Guard? Like there is a game for you. 
And so that was a really nice, like, when I say kind of that rising tide lifts all boats and it's a collaborative industry, like, that is something um, that works really well. And we ended up, like, bundling with them and doing a couple of, like, cross promotions and getting that bundle on the front page of Steam. And it really did, like, work really well for both of us. So what went poorly? Um, you know, we had the first uh, area, because the game is split into three acts, each of which takes about 20 minutes. So it, having that entire first act for players was a perfect demo length. That worked really, really well. However, we were kind of iterating on that, and like players were like already playing it. We were treating it as if it was like a live service game already. And so by the end of our kind of, you know, getting into early access at the end of our development period, that first area was like super, super balanced, but it was super balanced as if you weren't progressing any further past that. And so in the last couple of weeks before our early access launch, we ended up doing a bunch of things that players perceived as like we were nerfing content or we were taking away fun things, when really what we were doing is like, you know, spreading that out across the entire run, but they couldn't see that at the time. So we're launching patch notes being like, oh yeah, this thing doesn't get strong until level three now when it used to be really good right away and it's just all this stuff. And so there was a, a big backlash and we ended up launching into like mixed reviews pretty quickly. Um, and it was, it was stressful. It was a big stressful thing. Uh, and then the game to this day is just still incredibly difficult to balance. You know, I love Slay the Spire. It was like one thing that I was looking at so closely and their numbers are so like beautifully tuned on everything. But there's a big difference between like playing a card that attacks for six damage and throwing a thing into a field that can do between zero damage and 10,000. And so I learned pretty early on that like, uh, we couldn't copy their balance. We could copy a lot else, but that we were gonna have to figure out on our own. And that has really just been like play testing, play testing, play testing, um, and embracing the fact that like, yes, the design goes exponential. It's not like a, a small linear, improvement, it's like by the end of Act 3, you are doing like orders of magnitude more damage than you were doing in Act 1. And that's part of the fun, honestly. Um, what went well overall? Uh, you know, kind of it's a great minimum viable product. Like that original game jam was already a little sticky, so we knew that there was something interesting there. It wasn't super easy to build a shell around that. Like I said, we kind of did a misstep in going into the, the RPG space for, you know, only about a month or two. Um, but that core MVP, that core demo uh, was really, really nice for us. And there was a lot of points where like, you know, we had planned for this game to just be a six month project and then kind of end it as the pandemic was hopefully coming to an end. Um, but it kind of just, it was fun to work on and then it started picking up steam. But there were a lot of points where we could have just released the game, not done early access. We could have just like launched it for five or eight, ten dollars We had a lot of different points where we could have just like cut it off and I think that's something that indies don't often look closely at enough, where like if your game is just not picking up the steam that you need it to, like don't just like bury it and just let it die. If you can release something out there for $5, get something out on your portfolio, get a game out there that's gonna build a small audience or you know maybe become a cult hit, like look at Vampire Survivors, right? Like I don't think they ever expected that game to go as insanely big as it was. Like you look at the art style and everything right off the bat, and yet $5 game, they threw it out there and just, or what was it, $2 when it launched? And then it went up to five? Like, just they had this very small MVP that could then be built on and now it's, you know, a juggernaut of its own. And I think that's something that's really, really important for indies to look at. Uh, demo was super replayable. It kept people coming back. We had YouTubers that would come back every like month or so, if not more frequently, play the game, post a video, break down what they thought about like the, the changes. We had people going through the patch notes like a year before the game went into early access just because we had the demo up and we were treating it like it was a live service game anyway. Uh, the marketing, I, I kind of glanced over this, but we'll kind of, yeah, it's, it's not a dirty word. Um, so, you know, some people, a lot of indies just kind of look at it and they're like, oh, I just, I don't want to market the game. You know, I don't want to be making tweets. I don't want to be doing this. Like, I, I, it feels like you're like out on the street kind of handing out like pamphlets to something that nobody's interested in. Like, that's, it's terrible. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be. Because there are a lot of people out there looking for new games to play all the time. And if you're in the right spot and in the right place, they'll be happy that you're telling them about your game. 
It's not always easy to find those places, but when you do, like, it just suddenly, it makes it not a chore. It makes it like an actual fun thing to do. Uh, that said, like, it changes really fast. Like, you know, like, we got maybe, what, 10 years out of Unity before it kind of started to crumble and die. Video game marketing is like every year is just completely different. You know, the last like year and a half has been like, TikTok is great. You can get tens of thousands of wish lists from TikTok. And it could be banned any day now. So what's going to be the next thing? I don't know. Um, so it is really important to find something that you can have fun with and just iterate on it. Just keep it going and just like try not to make it a chore for yourself. Because if it's a chore for yourself, the people that you're kind of marketing to are going to know. They're going to read that. They're going to, they're going to feel it. It just it all comes all the way through. Um, yeah, that's the best thing that you can do. Uh, I learned like everything from these two people. Uh, Chris Zukowski, how to market a game. Uh, he's just awesome. He has a ton of free resources. He does like paid classes every now and then. Um, and then Simon Carless has like a, a newsletter. So I think two times a week, and then he's got a paid one if you pay. Uh, but two times a week, he's doing like breakdowns of like, how did this game sell 500,000 copies? And he just drills into it. Uh, he just did one on uh, this game called Dungeon Clawler coming out. That's going to be like the next big thing. And it's a, uh, a claw game roguelike. Um, and that team really knows what they're doing. And so he you know, sits down with them, talks about what they did right. Um, it's, it's just a good resource. Uh, for us, you know, we tried tweets, we tried putting some YouTube videos up, we tried a lot of like manual, like feet on the pavement, trying to get the game out in front of people, and none of it really worked for us, except for like streamers and YouTubers are just the biggest thing for us, like ever, like just by, uh, uh, you know, and just millions of views, like just it's a crazy thing that like we could never manually do ourselves. Um, and then digital events were like, the, the numbers, the big, the big eh. <laughs> sorry, the big second thing. I'm uh, running myself in circles here. Um, yeah, streamers and YouTubers, I'll get in a little bit about like how you make your game a bit more streamable, but uh, like Peglin would not be where it is without them. Like from day one, they were kind of finding that demo in the Steam Next Fest and like, like I said, revisiting it. They were providing feedback. Like for a while, I was able to watch like every single video. And that was helping me like not only to find bugs, but also to like balance the game, as well as find out like what are people excited about, what is a chore for them, um, just a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah, still sent out like hundreds of emails and keys. Like I'm pretty sure at some point I got my like email like marked as spam temporarily, just from like manually sending emails because I started having people like not replying to me that were like regular things and being like. Oh, you just ended up in spam for some reason. So don't do that, maybe, but uh, you do need to kind of get your game in front of them. And digital events were kind of the big thing for that. Um, so another kind of pandemic, silver lining, good timing. We were able to be in about four different Steam Next Fests, um, or three. It used to be like you could participate in as many as you wanted, and then you could only participate once a year, and then you were allowed to participate only once. But they kept on like, you know, had you participated earlier than you should have, they let you continue forward. So yeah, I think we're in, we were in three total. Um, and I wish that they had kind of kept that because I think it was a really good way to like trick indies into doing good marketing because you're getting your demo like ready, you're getting it polished, you're putting it out there, and then you're reaching out to streamers for each of these festivals. And you know, it's, it's like I said earlier, like marketing just changes so fast. Had they kept that up, that's what everybody would be doing, and then maybe it wouldn't work so well anymore. You know, Steam's big thing is to sell games and make money, so they clearly know what they're doing. But I was really thankful for that, like, you know, at the time, I didn't really want the demo available. I didn't think it was quite ready yet. But having this festival deadline was like, well, you got to get something out there. And it ended up working out really well. Um, yeah, digital events, like even if you don't have a demo, you really want to get in as many of these as you can. You know, there's a bunch of themed festivals. I know there's one coming up that's like games featuring frogs. So if your game features a frog, like, and you just have to like keep your eye on these things. Uh, the how to market a game, there's a Discord where people like share these events really regularly. So just making sure that you're kind of in there and people are getting eyes on your game, uh, really, really important. And then yeah, it gets your game not only in front of players directly, but also in front of streamers that are gonna be like a multiplier for any effort that you can put in. 
Ah, okay, here's the big like obnoxious slide. Um, I really, I swear I'm not doing this to like brag, but this is like for every one of these that we did get accepted into, there's probably 20 that we applied for and didn't, right? Like I would say like 20% of my job for that like year leading into early access was just like finding events and filling out forms. And it was not very fun. You know, you kind of end up with your like little snippet of like, what is the game description? What is the company description? Yada, yada. But like, that's just kind of how you do it, you know? And like, it's a little less soul sucking filling out these forms than it is like standing on the street corner and handing out like flyers. Because at least for these festivals, there are people looking for games, right? They're looking for new games to play. You're in the right spot for them to find your game. Um, that's it, there's no more obnoxious slides. <laughs> Uh, streamability, I mean, you know, I talk about streamers and YouTubers being our number one thing, and it is for a lot, a lot of indie devs. I understand that if you want to make like a linear narrative game, you're not gonna have the same necessarily like opportunities that we had. Uh, but any of these elements that you can bring into your game are going to help you. So for us, like unpredictability, we've got all the physics, we've got the randomness, um, you know, the map is different every time. Thank you, Slay the Spire. Uh, there's different strategies and builds that you can use. You know, as we ended up like adding classes and stuff, we kept on like expanding the possibility space and changing up. Like if somebody gets tired of playing one class, they can now move on to a different class and try that for a while. Uh, but also still using that like same core content, right? It doesn't matter what class you're playing, but you're still fighting the same enemies, you're fighting the same encounters, so as an indie developer, getting that content reuse, super, super important. And it also meant that anytime we added something, it had a big multiplier on like how much that content could be used and played. Um, you know, again, helping with replayability is huge. So even if you're just making like a small linear experience that's like there to tell a poignant story, I would look at what you could maybe do in some element of your game just to let the people that really love it engage with it a little bit more than they might otherwise. Uh, what went poorly? Yeah, social media. Whew, that was just boring for us. You know, you'd tweet something, you'd spend like a lot of time putting together a beautiful GIF, you tweet it out, and there's like three retweets, and it's everyone that's like on the team. It's just like nobody, it's not, it's not reaching anybody else. Um, that, was, that was never fun for us. Uh, traditional games press, you know, I'm not sure if this will change once we hit 1.0. I know a lot of press like doesn't really know what to do with early access games, especially early access indies. But like we've just had like zero articles out there. So we did fine without it. Maybe it would be nice if they were out there too, but that's okay. Um, and then, like I said earlier, you know, it was about, it was a little over a year and we still just had like 1,500 wish lists. Like it was, it was slow going. Like if I wasn't making the game for myself first, I probably would have like shelved it or just like released it on itch and just called it a day. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad I stuck with it. Um, there's like streamers, so I mentioned Alpha Beta Gamer directly here, but there are like streamers and YouTubers that specifically are out there for like alpha content and they don't want to review games that like other people have reviewed. And some of the channels are quite large, uh, but we just like, the game was discovered by other streamers in those festivals beforehand. But if I could have sent, like if I had known about him earlier and sent him like the, the game jam version of the game, there's a good chance that he would have played it and that probably could have gotten that ball rolling a little quicker. So that's something I think you just learn by, you know, chatting with other developers, just making sure you're a little bit more prepared um, for like capitalizing on some of those like specifically early beats of your game. Uh, Steam forums, oh boy, yeah, that. So we had people coming in starting fights about the price and then like people are like swearing and like breaking all sorts of rules on both sides of the argument and I'm coming in and like deleting comments, I'm locking threads, I'm like banning people and then people are coming on on their alts accusing me of censorship and like this is launch day, we've got launch bugs to fix, like I have better things to be doing with my time and I am just sitting there like sweating at like one in the morning being like what is happening here? And thankfully I was just like complaining about this to a friend and they were like, oh, just there's a button here and you push it and Steam will just like take over for like a week. Push the button, just, just let them do it. 
people, you know, if they want to accuse Valve of censorship, fine, that's, that's all good. Oh my goodness, that was a, a sweaty day. It was not good. Um, and then, yeah, there's probably a lot on the table that we could have been doing. Uh, we're a small team. None of us are marketers by trade or anything. You know, we tried working with the PR company for a little bit. Um, we had a, a part-time community manager for a little while. Um, there's probably, like, had we had more experience, the game maybe could be at a million sales right now. Maybe we could have been Bellatro. Uh, but, you know, we're happy and none of us are really doing work that we actively dislike and that is definitely a win. So development. So that was the intro. <laughs> now this is the like kind of core of the talk, the bootstrap of the talk. But I know that if I hadn't kind of covered that stuff, um, and I swear we're not like 10% through the way, it's like a little bit more than halfway through. Um, but if I hadn't covered that stuff, I would have been fielding all the questions about it in the Q&A. So I thought it was just better safe than sorry. Um, so the game started in October of 2019 at a game jam. Uh, it was Orca Jam over in Victoria. Maybe some of you have been there. It hasn't run in a few years. But uh, it was just myself and uh, an artist. So I originally started working just like with asset packs. And then one of my friends was like, um, well, why, you know, why do you have these asset packs? I can do pixel art. All right, come in and replace whatever you can before we launch the game, and uh, that's kind of what we did. The original version has no audio, uh, much to my chagrin, but uh, it was only we were only there for half the game jam, so it was 24 hours. So, still pretty happy with what we got. Um, for the next couple of months, I kind of worked on the game by myself, uh, with the artist kind of providing art whenever she could. Uh, and then we decided around March of 2020. I think it was like right when everything really locked down. Okay, let's make an actual go of this six month project. Let's get it out on Steam. Uh, so we worked with one of our uh, musician friends and a programmer friend that we, uh, we knew from game jams already. So, you know, there was no interview process. It wasn't like we were trying to find people to hire. It was like these were people that we knew already. And this is one of the reasons that I tell people that game jams are so, so important. Because even if it's not like the game, I mean, this was a Game Jam game, but it wasn't the Game Jam team. But I knew these people from previous Game Jam games. I had kind of a little roster of people that I knew and liked and knew I would like to work with. Um, and so it was easy to reach out to them and just get people uh, uh, doing it. And then, um, yeah, jack of all trades, you know, really a bit of everything. If you want to get a game out the door, you will need somebody to be a project manager. It's not glamorous, but like you need something to kind of guide, uh, guide the development team. Um, my design strategy, I'll kind of get into it in a little bit, is like I design games in Trello anyway, so it's already kind of there to be to, like project managed. So it's like, yeah, but you need to kind of have somebody with those skills. Um, and now business operations, you know, if you, you really have to have a plan, if the game takes off, what are you guys going to do? Are you a studio now? Who runs the studio? Um, and, you know, that kind of fell on me as doing everything else. But my now, like, day job is mostly just, like, making sure people get paid, applying for, like, funding and grants and, like, tax incentives and all this stuff. I don't spend, like, any time developing the game, I still get to do design, thankfully, uh, but that's something that you really need to, to plan around. And I'll kind of get into that in a little bit as well. Uh, we just, we didn't have contracts or anything, um, which is crazy looking back on, but uh, we just had like discord agreements being like, we're each gonna get X percent and we're gonna try and work as evenly as possible. Um, uh, once the game started making money, then, you know, we sat down with a lawyer and we got it solidified and we had, like, you know, times where the contract would end. Uh, we had, you know, what if somebody gets sick and can't work anymore? You know, it's not fair for everyone else to just still be paying that. And so you have all these contingencies and that's really what contracts are there for. Um, you know, depending on how serious you are, like maybe going into a game jam with a contract, which really feels against the, the spirit of game jams. but you just never know, right? You, you want to protect yourself. Like there was a few times for sure when like I was really, I was probably putting in like twice as much work as everyone else was because it was my baby. And I was starting to get a little grumbly about the contracts. Um, and you know, it, it didn't boil over into anything. It was kind of like we had adult conversations because these were people that I, I knew and liked um, and knew that we would work together well. but. The contracts are there to protect everybody, right? For, for a myriad of reasons. Um, so I don't know. That's, we have contracts now, and 
you know, once we've signed them, that's pretty much been it. We haven't had any, any issues that have needed them, but there's definitely a peace of mind knowing that they're there. Uh, evenings and weekends, that's tough. Yeah, um, this is, you know, talk about bootstrapping. This is really, you're gonna be doing it on the side of something. Um, for me, the biggest things were like, I needed not quite like accountability so much, but I needed like a, a reason to like work on the game in the evenings kind of thing. Like, and so in Victoria, we used to have like a hack night every two weeks. And so you'd go and you'd actually like sit down at the pub and you'd work on your game for a few hours and then everyone would just like check out what everyone else was doing. And so this was a fantastic regular check-in for like not only what did I get done tonight, but like what did I get done in the past two weeks? And I had like a, a little group of like eight people that were all like invested and interested in seeing like, you know, oh, did you make any new encounters? Like, did you make new peg layouts? Like or relics, like they just wanted to see one or two new things. And it was just good to keep that ball rolling, right? Because like, if you just like leave a side project and you're too tired and you just can't work on it for like two weeks, like that momentum really slows down and it's really hard to jump back into. Um, there are like online versions of this. So like itch.io is great. Like there are people up there that are looking for indie games that are experimental. They want to try new things uh, and they'll, they'll play updates when you put them out. Uh, I had a Game Jolt page for a while. I think it's good to get like a couple of eyes on your game and like be able to post updates. But overall, like it was just too much work to keep maintaining it. Uh, so I can't remember if we just left it or if we like, I think we removed the demo but left the page up. Um, there's a subreddit for this, r slash play my game. So if your game is like, you have to have something playable and then you can play, uh, post it in there. And it's not like you're just like hopping into r slash games and trying to like, you know, look at my indie game. It's really like, hey, I have something experimental and weird and I'd like feedback on it. And that's like the right place where people are looking for games. Uh, and then some early streamers. You know, the streamers are always kind of looking for games on their own too, but getting good at crafting a good email on like why you should be interested in my game goes a really long way. And there are streamers that play like super experimental games. Um, and not only do they, you know, you kind of get their audience that's also gonna come and try your demo and provide some feedback, but you're kind of getting in that like, that loop of like make content, send to streamers, get feedback, improve the game, send to streamers. Um, so it's really good practice to do like even early on. Like never think that your game is too early to show. Like nobody's gonna steal your idea. Um, and if they do, they're gonna do it after it's sold a ton of copies because then they've had it, you know, they've seen it uh, in action. So like when I stole Slay the Spire, it wasn't a big early thing. It was already like a big, uh, you know, it was already its own beast. And then same for us. Like we've had games that like are literally Peglin, like the UI is exactly the same, but then just like the game in the middle is different. So there's like a Brick Breaker one and a Pinball one. And it's funny to me because they copied the UI without thinking about why the UI was set up like that, but that's okay. So show your game early and often and just like iterate as much as you can. And if you're lucky, it makes me sick to say that, you'll get a pandemic that shuts everything down and then you have <laughs> all the evenings and weekends in the world. Um, go into like the tools a little bit because like you really do not need much. Uh, you know, there are companies out there that are always gonna like email you and be like, we can speed up your development by a huge amount. Use our new project management software and it's like, no, all I need is a big list of checkboxes. Like, that's it. I can have like lists in there. I can assign people to them. It's fantastic. Uh, and I know Trello got acquired like while we've been working on the game by Atlassian, which makes like Jira and all the big ones. Uh, and so I'm hoping they don't like come in and, and make it too crazy. I know they've limited it to 10 people per board now, but if you have more than 10, like you probably do need something bigger and more crazy. Uh, the game's made in Unity. Uh, kind of much to our chagrin, especially because we made the game like free to download on mobile as like a kind of demo, try the game before you buy it. And that pushed us over the million uh, installs. So it's like, well, thank you. If you'd told us that that was your plan with this install fee, we wouldn't have done that. So really sleazy business practice to just kind of like pull that out of nowhere. Uh, so we most likely will not be working with Unity in the future. Um, unless, you know, if they get acquired by somebody and things radically change, then maybe. But uh, yeah, we are, we're looking at like Game Maker and Godot for future games. Uh, and then Discord, that's just, that's what we do for all of our um, communication. We have like a public Discord that's like, we also just have our private channels in there, which makes me a little nervous sometimes. I think you probably should have it split up. 
but it's worked so far, so maybe my next talk will be a, a warning talk, but <laughs> it works. Um, I use Rider personally. If you use Unity or Godot and C Sharp, I highly recommend it. It's just like a faster kind of uh, editor. Uh, Asprite is fantastic. We use Adobe for all of our like promo art. Uh, and then yeah, Trello, Git, and Discord. Uh, we use like a ton of different assets in Unity. Like there is no shame in not reinventing the wheel. If you can download something for like you know 20, 30, 40, even a hundred dollars, that's going to save you like 20 hours of time. It's totally worth it. And then you know you can just plop that into your next project without having to like try and decouple it or write the original implementation in like this pristine decoupled thing to use in future projects. Um, this is one thing that I'm hoping that like by the time we get to this stage of our next game, Godot will have a more like robust uh, asset store. We kind of have like an open source solution right now, but I think there is a lot of value in like letting people just be full time asset developers and make money off of that. Uh, so that's kind of my big hope with Godot right now. But yeah, the, you know, the assets, the things like uh, in Peglin, we have like the fancy, fancy text. Um, Rewired is an amazing like uh, controller input. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we have in there, but yeah, there's, you know, we have like a serialization library. There's just all sorts of stuff just to make our lives a little easier. All right, what went poorly development wise? Um, it's a pretty simple game. Uh, it wasn't like super complex, so we haven't had any like major hiccups. But we really designed the game just to be like as fast for us to work on as possible. Um, which means like it's just not very extensible, it's not very moddable. We've had people like bless their hearts, they've, they've tried, they got in there. And then of course it being an early access game, we like broke almost everything. So I'm hoping after 1.0, you know, we'll try and support them a little better and then stop breaking things. Uh, but I think like if Peglin was moddable, like we'd probably be looking at like an order of magnitude, uh, more and more sales and more and more interest in the game, just because that player generated content can just be so interesting and fun. Uh, burnout is super real. Uh, take care of yourselves, please. Um, I think I lost just like a month of my life where I just wasn't able to do anything, like anything. It was terrible. Um, you know, the game just really like took off on us and we didn't have like the support for that. We didn't have a publisher that we could lean on. Uh, I felt suddenly like I had like 500,000 bosses. Everyone's just like yelling at you all the time. Um, oof, yeah, please take care of yourselves. Uh, and we didn't have a solid plan for like what this would look like. You know, it was never even our wild dreams that it would get to this threshold, especially this quickly, but like, this was a hobby thing. Like none of us really, it wasn't really our goal to run a studio. Like I had the corporation just so I could like release games on Steam. But like I, you know, I didn't wanna like hire people or be a boss or run a thing. Um, so that's kind of something that we're kind of looking at right now. Um, I've got Aaron sitting in the audience here like sweating, being like, <laughs> why, why did he hire me? Because <laughs> it's, it's helpful. You're very helpful, Aaron. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, we've got, we've still got questions. We still don't have all the answers. When it comes to like when Peglin is done and our next game is done, do we continue running the studio like a, like a company? Like do we pay salaries and pursue all the government initiatives that, you know, the BC Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit is amazing. It's fantastic. Um, you only get it if you're paying salaries, not like some weird profit share thing. Um, or should we just be a band, which is like, you know, way less risky. If a game flops, it's like, there was four people that were all kind of bought in. Um, it didn't work this time. Let's keep small, try again. Um, you know, indie games in particular, it's super, super hit based. You never really know what's gonna take off and what's just going to, to fall to the wayside. Um, you look at companies like Devolver, which is like, this is what they do, is like premium indie games year after year, and their stock price is just like totally down because their last couple of games haven't hit and they're still making the bulk of their money from Cult of the Lamb. Like, it's just, it's so unpredictable and I think indie dev just works so much better on a small scale where like there isn't that pressure to like pay salaries and then, you know, keep people, keep people's families fed. Um, it's, it's a weird industry. So we, we still are not entirely sure. Uh, I've just got a big handful of miscellaneous stuff that I couldn't fit in anywhere else. So I'm just gonna like rattle it all off. Um, 
Peglin has been mostly community localized. It's had its ups and downs for sure. It's really cool that we're in some languages that we wouldn't be in otherwise because most people are not going to pay to uh, localize their game into Dutch or Swedish. But we have people that were really interested and came in and did that and that's really, really cool. Um, but it does make things tricky when you go to like launch on consoles and you know you need like 100% localization by a certain point. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I would do uh, community localization in the future now that we kind of have the money in the bank to just pay for that up front. Uh, but it did make sense for the game at the time and you know, it, it, we're here, so it worked. Um, we worked with a, a Chinese publisher, uh, IndieArc, so they uh, translate the game and then release it into uh, China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, it's worked pretty well for us. Uh, they're working on the ISBN right now, which is like, getting official government approval from China to release the game officially. And if they get that, like that's gonna open the game up to a massive, massive audience. Uh, players in China right now can access the game on Steam, but it's kind of like, like legally gray. Um, and they can't access the game on mobile at all. So good thing to have. Um, the money is great. That was awesome. But uh, I wouldn't say it solved everything, so. I don't really know why that's in there, but I don't know. Just it's not it's not all roses. Is just all I'm saying. And make sure that you're kind of ready for um, for some of the kind of isolation um, that might come with some of it. Uh, there was an article that came out. So Chris Zukowski wrote an article um, about two or three weeks after the game released. And you know, I learned so much from him. I felt like the least I could do was kind of do an interview with him and give back some information. The article is called like, How Peglin Made a Million Dollars in Its First Week. And my family just like found this article very quickly and was kind of extrapolating, well, if you made a million dollars in your first week and it's been eight weeks, like you're buying dinner tonight. And it's just, you know, all these little comments for kind of months that continued on and thankfully like, Everything has kind of gone back to normal, but it was strange. And we were so busy anyway that like, it just, it was strange. So that's just, it's just in there, something to think about, maybe plan around. Um, and then yeah, it's, you know, this was my dream for a very long time. And then uh, it happened. And there was a big like, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and then there was a big like, what happens next? You know, that was it. So why do we go from here? Um, and then I kind of wish I'd used an alias. You know, we're not quite at the stage where we have like crazy fans yet, but like, whew, oh boy. Um, game jams are great. Don't be afraid to make small games, especially if they can expand or be cut back. Having that like flexible scope is super important. You know, if you make a $2 game, there's no shame in that. And you never know if it'll like, Vampire survivors, especially with the like crazy streamer ecosystem that we have. Uh, more games that you release, like you'll figure out, you know, after, oh, after two weeks, this game had like 500 plays on its.io, this other one only had 50. Like there's not as much interest there for one reason or another. Um, just, I cannot say the word streamer enough in this talk, but like seriously, as an indie dev with zero marketing budget, they are just incredible. Uh, and then, if you want to keep doing this as a team, somebody's going to have to be the business person. Should work that out ahead of time. It kind of, it wasn't like a surprise to me. Like I said, I had the corporation already anyway, but I really didn't realize how much work it would be like filing the taxes monthly, just like doing payroll all the time, just doing all these things that like, we're a real business that we have to do now that you don't have to do when you're four people in a garage. That is it. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dylan. And we have some time for questions. So if you have a question, put your hand and I'll bring this mic to you. Um, hello. Great talk. It was amazing. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned you had roughly 75,000 wish lists on launch. Do you remember what your conversion rate was on launch? Was it the usual 10 to 20 percent, or was it like? I think it was around 10 to 20 percent, but the surprising thing for us was like the overall conversion, where it was like, you know, we sold more copies than we even had wishlisted, really shocked us. Um, but what happened there was, 
you know, I had emailed dozens of streamers being like, this is the early access launch. Like, here you go. You can start playing the game whenever. Like, I, I don't really, I didn't really have like a, uh, a lock date. I can't remember the term for that is, but you know, I didn't have a, a date for them. Um, and none of them were playing the game. And so I'm sitting there just like, just so disappointed. Like, oh, I thought we really had something. And then on launch day, just like everyone on our like top 10 wish list like of streamers that we wanted to play the game came out and all played the game at once. And then that took the Steam algorithm and it just kind of like exploded. Uh, but yeah, I don't know the actual just like conversion rate, unfortunately. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, I think you mentioned briefly that you had uh, a part-time community manager for a while, and I'm just wondering, like, how do you handle that now? Like, is that, do you still have somebody dedicated for that, and do you think that that will change um, in the future once you get into one now? Yeah, that's, that's been an interesting, like, learning thing for us. Um, because we hired like somebody that was very, very junior, just like trying to break into the industry for the first time, because that's kind of what we were all doing. Um, and I think that that just was a little too tough for us. Uh, so it was good having somebody there just to like be doing stuff for a while. Um, but after a while, there was just so much kind of falling between and just causing like me a little bit too much stress. Um, so we did end up parting ways. And uh, we kind of looked at it being like, you know, if, uh, if Eric Barone can not have a community manager for Stardew, then we can probably get away with it, considering they're like a thousand times bigger than us. Um, but yeah, I do kind of wish that things had shaken out a little differently there. All right, thank you, thank you for the talk as well, thanks. I'll go to the back here. We got quite a bit of time for questions, so hopefully we can get through everyone. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, Peglin, like a lot of roguelike games before it and after, is quite a complex piece of machinery with a number of parts that are related but not necessarily dependent on each other entirely, it's just like relics versus balls versus enemies. Um, when developing those pieces, were there any that you found uh, came easier before one another versus after? Were there any cases where you started developing down one path only to find you were blocked by another uh, system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really been like my design style is just kind of like throw stuff at the wall and then like play the game and see what's missing and what kind of needs like patched in. And so there were some ideas that, you know, came very, very early. Um, like we have a, a, a weighted chip relic that adds like multipliers onto the bottom and, you know, very divisive relic. A lot of people hate it. Uh, and we found that later on, like there had been so much kind of specific logic for using those slots in particular ways that using them later for things like the portal effect that puts your orb back at the top were already being like much, much more difficult. Um, so that was one thing we're kind of having like your possibility space to find ahead of time would definitely help. But I think there is kind of a bit of a magic of just like playing the game and just seeing kind of what would be interesting or what would be fun that you maybe hadn't thought of originally. Uh, but yeah, it is kind of, it's a bittersweet moment when you start getting towards like the end of development and realizing that like some code paths are just going to be like unruly to kind of work with. And you know, some relics we can develop in like 20 minutes if it's just like multiplying something or throwing a, a something, you know, a couple of different things that can just be done super easily. And others would just be like days and days of work now because of the way that the older parts of the game have been built. Thank you. Any comments on the front? Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I had a question about your communication with streamers. Um, so was it something where you cold email to lock them with keys? Is it a relationship you've developed over time? I know it's you know different every day, every year, uh, but I'm curious on how you went about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we did it in a couple of different rounds. Like definitely the first time we were going to be in a Steam Next Fest, I just searched for like anybody that had played Slay the Spire, anybody that had played Peggle, anyone that had played Round Guard, even just like, you know, I think Brotato had a demo that people were playing at the time. Like anything that like 
was similar enough. You know, they have to be interested. You can't just email the massive streamers and just, you know, play my game. You have to have a kind of a hook for them. Um, and so I did that first round for the first Steam Next Fest. And then, like, you know, maybe a year later, just like sent out another round of keys. I didn't check if their keys had been used or not. Just, you want to make it just as easy as possible. Here's a key. Um, so a year later, we were kind of like, not quite coming up to early access yet, but like the game had been out for a while. Hey, we're doing this big update. Here's, you know, if you'd like to check it out. And then the final round was just right before early access. Here's like the, all the details you need to know. Here's like when the game is going to go live. Um, and so that was our big like final push. And yeah, a few times, you know, I had just like a template set up in Gmail. So I wasn't using like a service to send these. I was like manually sending them. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I got marked as spam on one of the bigger things where I think I had sent like, you know, probably 200 emails in like a day kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there's a good way to get around that, but. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, I think some of my friends and I played uh, right away, and we immediately ran into the bad cheese round guard. <laughs> and from my perspective as a developer, that's like OP, basically, and, and usually we get there to the ground right away. So I'm curious on on your design philosophy, um, because it's also super fun, and where where do you sort of draw that line now as, as you know, the latest round of updates has just come out for the game, and you made some changes, you got some new enemies and stuff, so maybe you can just talk a bit more on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, the round cheese, like round guard cheese combo was like, uh, direct response to me playing a bunch of Slay the Spire and like never getting an infinite. And knowing that there are infinites in that game, and even after like 100 hours, just still never having gotten one, and I was like, okay, Peglin needs an infinite. And ideally, it would be something on the pegboard, but it was just too problematic to like, the player could just get stuck forever. And I never really wanted just like an end my shot button, which has been asked for a ton whenever we've kind of introduced these like fake infinites. So that was just kind of in there as just like, a, hey, if you get these like three combinations, it's kind of just like an, an auto win. And in a roguelike, you know, that's, that's kind of fine. Like, hopefully it's not the first time somebody plays the game and they don't really see what the game is all about. But having those just kind of weird win conditions in there, I think is like really important, really just keeps things interesting. Yeah, so for us, we've only worked with the PR agency once, and it was kind of around like, oh, they're going to like get our GDC booth ready for us and set up meetings and try to like get all of that ready. And it was kind of lining up with like a massive update, still early access. And you're right that like, yeah, press really does not care about like indie early access games. They kind of like have one article saved for you if the game is big enough at 1.0 is kind of my my perspective you know I don't know 100% yet but just from what I've gleaned um, but yeah, our experience with the PR company was just not great so like we overpaid for the GDC booth by like a few thousand dollars and then they didn't set up a single meeting <laughs> and uh, they had done some stuff for the booth but like it just uh, it was not a good experience. So we haven't gone back yet. And you know, other indies will ask me like, oh, I'm thinking about working with like a PR company. And some of them are even like attempting to work with RevShare now, which like, whew, yeah. So I'm not the right person to ask about PR companies, but uh, I'm hoping that, you know, 1.0 will kind of have enough of that press where we can kind of splash a little bit more into like the traditional gaming industry. So right now we're kind of quite known among like indies and quite known among roguelikes. Uh, but there's definitely, you know, you look at how many reviews Terraria has on Steam and like it's, we barely scratched the surface. There is like so much out there. 
Come on around here. Cool. Good talk, Philip. Um, I've also done bad for say this part. <laughs> um, in your game jam, at the end of your game jam uh, prototype, you call the game sticky. What do you mean by that? Um, you know, sometimes like you'll sit your friends down and show them something that you've worked on and they kind of turn to you and they like smile and nod and then they like get up and go do something else and they're being very polite about it. Uh, this was like four of my friends were stuck around the screen like arguing over who got the next try. That was like people already wanted to just like play that simple little arcadey slice even though like it's it's icky, you know. It's it's sticky, but like it it just does. It's not a good feeling prototype because it was just like whipped together in a day. But it's already kind of competitive enough. It was kind of hooky, yeah. It's just people wanted to get their hands on it, so that was a really good sign early on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, you talked a couple of times just about the stress you went under. And I was just wondering, like, do you have any like steps or practices that you use to be able to like take care of yourself over your work, even when your work is like so important to you? Mm -hmm. um, you know, therapy goes a very long way. Um, my entire identity was like wrapped up in this thing, and so it was so hard for me to like detach from it at all. You know, you're going out with friends and you're sitting there and you're still just like checking the endless scrolling feed of like people talking about the game, especially around launch or big updates. Uh, and yeah, that's definitely not healthy. Um, and then, you know, there's just lots of other things too, like breathing exercises. It's just like when the whole world feels like it's kind of closing in on you, like there's lots of things that you can do to take care of yourself. Uh, being physically active, that was something that just like completely went out the window for me because it was like, the people need me, you know, I can't go on an hour run, like, I, there's so much that needs to be done, like, it was just really all consuming for a while and I really felt that like, you know, I owed people so much because my life had just like, it was like winning the lottery, right? Like it's just, there's 500,000 people out there that put their faith in the game and like what it would be coming out of 1.0. And I just I spun my wheels for a little bit, and yeah, you need to just kind of learn to take a step back, and it is it's just a job, and there's a lot more to life, and uh, we're you know ridiculously lucky to be in the position that we're in, but your health should always be priority number one. Thank you. <laughs> one here, the one at the back, then we're not just back. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, it's okay. We got. Um, I'm curious, by the time you had a Steam page and it really took off in terms of wish list, do you have a sense of what your Steam page itself looked like? Was it like full on you had a pretty decent trailer, you had your localization, etc. Like, what Do you remember what it even looked like? Very similar to what it looks like now. <laughs> if you boot up the Steam page, um, yeah, you can check it right now. Um, the localization did come a little bit later for sure, especially after we teamed up with like IndieArk and had like the professional like Chinese localization in particular went a long way. Um, our regional breakdowns for those that are curious are like 50% of our money comes from the US and then Germany and China are kind of like tied for second and third. Um, so they've done, you know, done a good job of getting the game out into China there and that localization goes a really long way. But yeah, I think we still have the original trailer up as just like our second trailer. And then we actually just replaced the screenshots. Um, or, but it hasn't, probably hasn't been published yet. So if you check it soon, you'll see like kind of the early screenshots that look way different than what's in the game right now. Um, but yeah, I would say the biggest things for Steam page are just like really making sure that your like capsule is good and that first like descriptive block. And then people really don't read the rest, but having GIFs in the like big, like the long description block really helps to like draw eyes in there. Okay, last one at the back here. Hello, thank you for coming all the way out <laughs> to us. Very much appreciated. Um, so the the breakup process with publishers. I have some friends that are stuck in that circuit right now, and a lot of them are really struggling with the idea that their game may not be successful because they can't find a publisher for themselves. And uh, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that moment where you were like, we're just going to go ahead. We're going to keep trucking on, even though 
we're having all these big boardroom meetings and, and you know, the corporate side of the game world might not be interested in your product, like how you decided to continue being confident that this was the path forward, and I'm curious what drove that. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. Um, so at that point, so we applied to about a dozen publishers and like we didn't get so much as like a call back. We never had any meetings or anything. This was around the time where the game had, I think about 1500 wish lists. We'd been working on it for about a year. The only real reason I wanted a publisher is because I like had a day job in the industry that I didn't love. You know, I was working on like mobile games, in-app purchases, really did not feel ethical to me. Um, I really just wanted to get out of there and focus on this thing. And so if anybody were to bite and help fund it, that would have been great. Uh, but really, at that point, I was still just making the game for myself. So had the game's goal to have been like a commercial success and like pay the bills and hire a team and do all this stuff, that's probably when I would have just like pushed it out and shipped it and just been like, I'm not getting the traction. Um, but the goal was just like to keep myself sane during lockdown and make a game that I personally thought I would love. Um, so we just, it was a you know, natural decision to just kind of keep plucking along at it. But yeah, it's you know, not an easy inflection point when you're not seeing that interest come from publishers. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs> thank you, Billy.